It is just a huge honor to be sitting in my house today and have Joy Millis come by. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> her you. website is shoutforjoy.com. She comes from Charlotte, North Carolina. Joy Millis is the foremost authority on the business of implant dentistry with a unique combination of specialty and general practice expertise. As a professional speaker and trusted advisor, Joy helps dental professionals accelerate the implementation of their strategic goals and objectives. She is an innovator in practice development solutions, influencing patients to receive quality dental care, getting paid without insurance interference, developing referral relationships, and recovering lost patients. Joy came to the professional of dentistry at the age of 15, filling in for dental team members where her mother served as a receptionist. Joy's personal life was changed through orthodontics and orthodontic surgery. Implant dentistry was introduced to Joy in 1978 when she joined a practice investigating the service. Moving from surgical assistant to administrator, Joy skillfully developed the marketing, management, and communication systems for the practice that quickly became a training center for doctors from all parts of the globe. Joy's business expertise and hands-on knowledge enhances the value that she brings to the platform, as well as in private practice setting. As one doctor stated, apart from her abundant enthusiasm, what sets Joy apart from the myriad of other speakers that can talk the talk, Joy has walked the walk. For over 20 years, Joy has taught the business of implant dentistry as a visiting faculty member for continued education at Georgia Regents University, the University of Texas Health Science Center, and Oregon Health Science Center. Joy is the proud recipient of the Seattle Study Club 2006, the Charlie English. Oh my God, I love Charlie English. How long ago did he pass away? Did you away? know it was about, oh, I guess about eight years ago. Oh my God, I, I get sad every time I see that name. I what too. a friend. Charlie English Community Education Award. Her 20 year Seattle Study Club relationship has included giving the symposium, opening keynote, several breakout sessions, emceeing the symposium, along with providing presentations for over 200 Seattle Study Club events, with clubs requesting that she return again and again. Thank you so much for coming by. <laughs> I'm glad to you be know, here. You know, let me tell you something about Charlie English that I love the most is, um, these dentists, the, the difference between Dental Town and Facebook is Facebook, if you post your implant case and someone says, you know, I, I, I don't like that. You should have done this. They just unfriend you. Right. Or on Dental Town, you know, there's a quarter million dentists on there. So you put an implant case <laughs> there. You better have balls that drag oh, on the sidewalk God. when you walk. Because if 100 people, you know, they have to say it politely if they're rude. Then they can hit the um, the um, the um, what is that called the the report button abuse. report abuse button. But what I liked about Charlie English is every implant lecturer, every cosmetic dentist goes and just shows all their most perfect cases, and they just walk away and they got everybody in this illusion that they're perfect. And Charlie English says, "Well, that's not real life. That's crazy." And all of his <laughs> lectures are on. All of his failures, he didn't show a single successful case. And it was the most impactful way to teach because when you see that he skipped this step and it all went south, it really had an impact. So there's right. greed and fear, but Charlie English, he had to be humble. Oh, he was terrific. Oh, one of the things that I would call Charlie on anytime a company wanted to sponsor me to speak, if I didn't know the company, I'd, I'd want to know their credibility. I would call him if they were an implant manufacturer, and I'd say, Charlie, tell me about this company. You know, are they good people? Are they going to be here tomorrow? Or, you know, should I work with them? Should I not work with them? He would tell me everything about them, what was good about their implant, what, whether I should work with them, if they had good management, good people. I love that. But the other thing I loved about Charlie, we would be on the same meeting a lot with, because I've spoken at implant meetings now almost 40 years. Can you believe it? And uh, Charlie would be at the meetings, and, and sometimes he'd walk up to me and he'd say, Joy, you're looking good. Sometimes he'd walk up to me and he'd say, Joy, you look tired. <laughs> if, if Charlie English said, Joy, you look tired, I look tired. He was honest. You know, he, he didn't, you know. And his me... last stint was, what, Green Laboratory in Arkansas? Uh, it, uh, I think that was it. I think yeah. I know it was Little Rock, Arkansas. Was it Green? No, the name of the dental lab. Was, oh, I, was... I'm not sure it was Green. I'm not sure it was Green, but he was oh. in Arkansas. Yeah, he I think it was. Arkansas. I think it was Green Dental Lab. Will you Google that, Ryan? Is there a Green Dental Lab? And and uh, but um, you know the funniest thing about that? What's that? It was in a dry county. 
Oh, and so Charlie so to get liquor, and you know, I you know, it's hard to imagine that there's still dry counties. So I said, does that does that uh, what la- the one of the last times I ever talked to him, I said, so does that suck? You got to get in the car. And I said, how far you got to drive for liquor? And he said, uh, like whatever it was, forty five minutes or whatever. And I says, was that suck? He goes, oh hell no, I make three hundred bucks a trip. I just load up the whole damn trunk, and then when I get back to the lab, I sell it all to everyone else. Oh god. <laughs> So he was a bootlegger, but uh, so he was a great um, guy. congratulations on Thank speaking. Uh, I mean, um, prestigious events, two hundred times Seattle Study Club. You're in Phoenix nice. speaking. Um, what 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 are you passionate about today? What what are you speaking about? Well, I mean, uh, I'm here to talk about communication. We're talking about team, uh, the how the team influences treatment acceptance, how patients are lost, and how we lose patients because of communication and and or lack thereof. Uh, I'm also going to talk about heroes. There are a lot of heroes. I mean, you know, depending on where you are, the economy's great or the economy's bad. You know, I've been in dentistry long enough to see it ebb and flow and up and down and all that. But uh, it's been kind of interesting for me to see incredibly thriving practices. And sometimes it's uh, some of the team members, staff members who are doing things that nobody else is willing to do that makes a difference. And the main thing that they do is they know how to keep patients. Uh, Patients are lost. I mean, right now, and I don't know what your research or what you're finding in the marketplace, but right now, patient retention is a big deal. Everybody calls me and says, market, market, help me, market, help me. You know, how do I get more new patients? And I say, well, learn how to keep the ones you've got, and then we'll find you some more. But if you learn how to keep the ones you've got, you won't need any more new patients. You're not treating the ones completely that you have. So... Yeah, it's funny because dentists are an entire generation behind the S&P 500. Like, like um, the everybody on television advertising is a loyalty program. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody's gone to Chase and Costco and Walmart and flown Southwest Airlines in America. They 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 only want to keep their patients. And the most hilarious, you'll go to a small town of five thousand people in the middle of Arkansas. And here's his dentist. He's practiced from age 25 to 65 mm-hmm. in a town of 5,000. And you go up to a 65, like, well, what, what do you need? He goes, well, I, you know, I, I need new patients. Um, what, <laughs> what do you recommend for advertising? I'm like, dude, you've pissed off everybody in the entire town. I mean, how do you, and how do you need new patients 40 years later in a town of 5,000? Oh, and then when you sit there and say, well, let's not spend, you know, when I got to school 30 years ago, advertising is taboo. And then within 10 or 15 years, he said it should be 3%. Now a lot of people are running around saying it should be 5 to 7%. And then you say to that mm-hmm. person, um, well, you know, um, why don't you give a painless shot? Why don't you get, uh, why don't you get nitrous oxide? Why don't you, why don't you do anything that will make the customer like, happy? Be nice. <laughs> hire, hire staff that, that communicate. <laughs> right. So I, I want to answer this question. If I line up 100 dentists and I say, what keeps you up at night? What stresses you out? It's never their bonding agent. It's never their implant system. It's always the fact that their staff is driving them nuts. The assistant's <laughs> fighting with the hygienist. Uh, it, it's always HR. And if it's not the issues with the staff, then it's issues with the patients. But it seems like the only thing that stresses out humans is other humans. What, what advice would, and, and then the, the dentist, after he gets done doing the root canal, he can't wait to, you know, he sees the, the crazy so he just goes right to his office and shuts the door. He, he hides. Yeah, he hides it. So, so what advice do you give these guys? Well, you got to. You've got to. If you're not going to be the communicator, you need to find someone who can. If you're not going to know what's going on in your practice, you need to find someone who who does. And as a consultant, many times the time you know when they call a consultant is when it's already too late and they're in you know they're imploding, and they're not only out of love with their staff, they're actually suicidal or depressed and hate it and I wish I wasn't doing this sort of thing. So it's a critical issue. I recommend that you have meetings, that you you, uh, certainly get together and find out what the issues are. Um, Most of the time, when I go into an office and the doctor is pointing the finger at the staff, the staff is just as eagerly, eagerly pointing the finger at the doctor because they don't like the doctor. The doctor won't talk to them, won't tell them what's going on, uh, won't pay them, won't, uh, won't uh, educate them, won't, you know, won't bring them along with them in the process of, of you know, having them in the office. They, you know, it's like strangers just happen to show up and work together, but they're not engaged. 
Um, with staff, the ideas people support the most are the ones they come up with themselves. So what I try to do is, is help the doctor engage the staff in learning how to do things, uh, but more importantly, learning how to think. Um, doctors will tell me, here's, here's one of the things, for example, I, I tell them over and over and over and over again how to do something, and, and you know they keep coming to me with the same question. It drives me crazy. Why do they keep coming to me with the same question? And it's very simple. It's because you keep answering the question. You keep giving them the answer every time they come to you instead of saying, what do you think? Many times the, the staff are not thinking. They just need to learn how to think. Some of the times they don't think because they've been confronted by a doctor who says, you're stupid, you're, it, you're an idiot, you can't do this. And so as a result, they stop thinking, they stop asking questions, they stop, you know, they just show up, do a bare minimum, do what they can do to get by, just to keep their job you know, as long as they possibly can, you know, because they're afraid, because doctors get angry when they're asked questions instead of engaging the staff member in learning how to think on their own, how to figure out the answer, how to uh, be trusted with an answer that they have. I had one doctor that hired me for consulting. Uh, immediately she told the staff, she said, you know, I really like the ideas that I've heard from Joy, you know, I've heard her speak a few times and, and I like the ideas and if, if you hear, you know, ideas from her you want to implement, run it by me first and uh, then, then, you know, we'll decide what we're going to do. The same week I went to another office, the doctor said to me, you know, um, I like your ideas and as she engaged her staff, it was two female dentists, as she engaged her staff, she said, you know, if Joyce got an idea you think is going to work here, go to it. Just get it done. Just put it in. You know, because I, I trust you guys that you'll make a good decision about what we do and Joy's got some good ideas. In working with those two different offices, the one office where the doctor said, run it by me, run it by me, run it by me, uh, was the one who ended up not not getting things done as quickly. It took two years for her to really get engaged in, in transforming her practice into one of the largest in the country. The other doctor immediately jumped on board and started taking action and doubled over the time to get things done much faster than the rest of the people. You know, it's so, um, it, it's basically natural selection. The, you couldn't get into dental school if you didn't get straight A's in calculus, physics, geometry, all this stuff, and those aren't any of the skill sets any of these dentists need. No. It, it's um, it's kind of like the deans, you know, they, the research shows them that by doubling the supply of dentists, you're not gonna get dentists out in the rural. Mm -hmm. The only way you get dentists in a town of 5,000 is you got to take kids from towns of 5,000. Only a kid that was born in a town of 5,000 goes back to a town of 5,000. So if they really want rural dentists, then only let in rural people. And the only thing a patient judges you on is how you make them feel. They never remember the dental work. You can point no, to a bridge, don't. a gold crown. Right. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked on patients that only had one implant. I said, well, who did that implant? Uh, it's like, how did someone get in your mouth and stick <laughs> a piece of titanium in your head? And you don't know. And you, don't, you don't know. Um, so many dentists, so many patients will know the name of the office. They'll say, I went to uh, uh, Saddle Creek Dentist. What was the dentist's name? They don't know. They, they don't know. So, so it, all I, I, I tell the dentist when you come out of dental school, what matters the most is that you have an amazing bedside, chairside manner, mm -hmm. and that you have amazing um, staff that you attract and retain and keep for 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, my assistant Jan's been with me 30 years. My, today was my um, Lori. She's my, we call each other Batman and Robin. Uh, she celebrated 19 years today. Oh. And uh, she says that, uh, I, I said, do you think you go for 20? She goes, well, I'm going to beat your ex-wife. She was there 20. She goes, I'm definitely, <laughs> definitely doing 21 just to beat your ex by a year. But if you can't attract and retain long-term staff, then you're not going to attract and retain uh, your patients. And what we know now in the average dental office, by the time they get to 5,000 charts, 4,000 them are gone. So, so talk that, that so they Let's want, about that. They, they want a bunch of new patients Yeah. because that's easy. It's easy for me to write a check and put up a billboard, a monument sign, or do a direct mail campaign. What's hard is to look in the mirror and say, why did 80% of your patients never come back? Right. So why did 80% of my homies patients never come back? 
Well, because they were they became invisible in the practice, essentially. I go into an office when they hire me and they want me to do marketing. One of the things I do is sit down at the computer. If they've got one, I can sit down at. And, <laughs> you know, because they all hog the computers and I can't always get to them. Or I'll sit down at the computer with one of them, which is my, even, my favorite thing to do. And I'll say, let's, let's look at patients. Because when they hire me to market... I want to know that the marketing plan is going to be effective because they keep the keep the consumer. They retain the consumer. They're not just going to get them in there and lose them because that's a failed marketing plan. I mean, that's ineffective. It's got to be a, a plan that will not only get the the consumer, the the patient in this case, but also a plan that will keep that patient because if you lose them, you've just wasted your, your dollar. You, you, you've spent money on marketing that wh whether it's five, seven percent, whatever it is now, you've spent money on marketing and then it's wasted money. And so then you, you're continually trying to get new patients. Now, some doctors like doing that. It's just like, just let them run through here. Let's get hundreds of them in here. Just, you know, it's the law of averages. We'll keep some, we'll lose some. But doggone it, what if you, what if you were able to get fewer and did more and kept them forever and they referred people like them? I, you know, that's pretty excellent marketing with, with no significant expense going out the door. So I would sit down. I would go through records and usually about you know, 20 records, maybe 50 if there was time that I, you know, could go through records, straight in a row in the alphabet, beginning at about M in the alphabet. I started there because the hygienist always worked the A, Bs, and Cs. When the doctor goes on vacation, what happens is the doctor says, you know, while I'm gone, why don't you go through some of these records, get some of these patients back in here, you know, uh, we've got holes in the schedule, there are holes in the hygiene schedule, see if you can get some of these patients back in. So they start going, you know, through the records after the doctor leaves, but they hate doing it. The moment the doctor walks out the door, the, the, um, the assistant or whoever is there says, uh, I don't want to call these people. You want to call these people? If they wanted to come in, they would have been here. I don't want to call them. You want to call them? What a waste of time. I don't want to bug them. And then they say, well, okay, I'll call one. They call one and say, do you want to come back? Didn't think so. Hang up the phone. And now what I'm finding, years ago, I've been in dentistry for a long time. Years ago, we would give patients a three-year survival rate. Some brilliant assistant came up with the idea years ago to put a little date sticker on the edge of the chart. You remember those date yeah, stickers? Yeah, I do. That was to make it easy to get rid of your patients while you're on vacation. You would leave. We'd call one. They wouldn't schedule. So we just go through the chart rack and pull out everybody who had not been in in the last three years. Now we're computerized. We've got wonderful computer records, and we've got all these records that are invisible, out of sight, out of mind, and the doctor goes on vacations. Why, why don't you go through these patients' records, see if you can get some of these people back. And so we start going through, through records, and we get tired of it, and then we just pull out that little easy button that's a key on the, uh, on the keyboard there on the computer that archives. Bang! Patients are gone. And what I'm finding is patients are gone within one year. They're archived in a year. Doctors will run into a meeting. I give them a little task to go through records and see really how much dentistry is filed and forgotten. You mentioned 5,000 records, 5,000 patients. Let's say we've got 5,000 patients in a, in a town. On average, when I go through 5,000 records, and I don't even have to go through all of them, but you can, uh, it, when I go through half of them don't have an appointment for anything. And these are 5,000 active patients. Patients we, we say we're, we're treating, 5,000 active patients. They're not even archived. I just go through active patients. 50% of them are not even scheduled for anything. And, and I look at that and I think, this is like crazy. Why is, how can we you know, have hygienists, have a schedule, have doctors, sometimes with a hole in their schedule. How is it possible? And when I go through them and find that, you know, if you have 5,000 records, you know, 5,000 patients, and half of them, that's 2,500 of them, don't have an appointment for anything, not even hygiene, and let's say we value them at what the average value that insurance companies say they're worth each year, $1,000, and you've got 2,500 who don't have an appointment for anything, average value of about $1,000, which is what insurance says they're worth. Why wouldn't they be worth that to us? $1,000. And you've got 2,500. That's $2,500,000 filed and forgotten, invisible, waiting on you to go on vacation and somebody to push the little button and pew, they're gone. 
That's almost a free divorce, just sitting in your charts. Right there. My gosh. I went through one office. The doctor had four doctors, four hygienists, and holes in their schedule. I walked in. They had the hybrid system, hybrid being computer records and charts on the wall. They had both, <laughs> the hybrid system. And so I said, what, sh what can I look at? Can I look at the computer? Anybody got a free computer? I can get to the computer and, you know, and immediately realized, my gosh, it's more than 50% are lost here, more than 50%. So I said to the staff, I said, you guys have some time on your hands every now and then. You know, you walk up front, your patient's not ready, patient's not here, their insurance hasn't been verified, you know, it takes 45 minutes to do that. And so you're waiting, 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 and, and uh, you're standing around. Walk up to the chart rack. Just do that. Walk up to all this active patient, because the boxes were in the clock, you know, in the room next door. Walk up to the active patients on the chart rack. Pull the next chart, and we'll put a little marker in there. Pull the next chart, and when you pull it out, just simply ask the question, do they need any treatment? Everybody needs hygiene, you know. Everybody needs that. That's a grant. Do they need any treatment? Uh, besides hygiene, because everybody needs that. Do they need any treatment? And then the next question is, are they scheduled or not? And I had some little post-it note red flags, you know, like you're using a bookmark or something. I had a few. And I said, here's your starter marker kit. Just flag the charts. Just flag the charts. And, and uh, you, you know, you might have to go to the computer, see if they're scheduled. That's okay. Do whatever you need to do. But just, I don't want that computer access to hold you back. Flag the chart. If they need treatment, they're not scheduled. Flag the chart. I came back two months later. They had a lot of spare time, apparently. And I walked in, and the chart rack was full of these red flags. They had to go to the store. I mean, they had to buy bulk red flags, these little post-it note flags. Red flags on, on, on row after row after row. We calculated. The red flags, not scheduled, if they were only valued at what insurance companies say they're worth, about $1,000 each year, $7,200,000 in their active rack just filed and forgot. But this was a complex restorative practice. This was a practice that prided themselves on doing full mouth dentistry beyond the max that insurance limitations put on patients. And, and so we know that the average value of a patient was way more than $1,000. So, but... Just if it was a thousand, seven million. Well, you you spent your whole life really coaching elite practices to be more elite, right? Um, what what do you what, so what do you what is your um, low hanging fruit for these guys to go to the next level? <laughs> the low hanging fruit: if you get a patient, don't lose the patient, unless by choice. Now I do teach risk management, and the time to decide you don't want to treat a patient is before you treat the patient. Many young dentists, I think, think they have to treat everyone. And uh, when, I, when I think of risk management, I, I think number one, don't get married. Number two, don't have kids. <laughs> Ryan, did I? Ryan, did memo? sorry, oh, Ryan. You can th and, edit you know, that out. You can just stay single. You can. We'll adopt kids. you, Ryan. Okay, I've done that. There we go. That's all. The risk is gone. So, so in risk risk management, um, that is the difference between a young twenty five year old dentist and a fifty five year old dentist. Is that when you see crazy? You can walk away from but the young people. Yeah. They need they, money. They, 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 they need, need to pay money. The they got loans. They, you know, and that's yeah. something they learn to regret that they talk people into doing treatment. It's very hard. So well, well, I guess well, for, before, let me back up yeah. on the young on the young dentist. The first thing I te try to teach them is you know get debt free as soon as you possibly can. Oh my God! So they, that you they, don't they, have to. If you want to hide something from a millennial, you put it in the oven. Oh, wow. uh, they they don't cook. They eat out every meal. Um, right. You know, you could buy a six pack for four dollars, and they go buy the nine dollar drinks, and they eat at the right. Um, they my car is two thousand four, or with one hundred and forty thousand miles, and they drive brand new Beamers yeah. at the dental school. Well, they learn the hard way, you know, when they can't pay their bills and can't, you know. Well, pay I, I want to say one more thing on risk management. It's um. Okay. I'd say the biggest thing, they, they don't know when to walk away from crazy. But number two, they let the patient talk them into doing something that they don't want to do. Exactly. And, and, and every time, they always start the story with, I knew it, that's not what I wanted to do, but he insisted. It's like, he insisted? I'm pretty sure you're the doctor. And they, they have to stick their tongue in right. a light socket four or five times before they realize. Right. So, so they usually, the birdie usually tells them they're crazy and this is the wrong treatment plan. 
yeah. and then they just do it anyway. Right. I asked a uh, doctor on peer review. I said, uh, what do you do? I mean, what, these poor dentists, you know, they let the patients talk them into doing treatment and compromise care. You know, it's, it's, the doctor might have lofty goals for the patient and, and the tooth needs a crown, for example, and the patient says, oh, I can't afford that, can't you do something else? And, you know, like a five surface restoration the doctor gets talked into that might end up crumbling and having a problem. And so I asked peer review, a doctor in peer review in a, in a state in the northern corridor of the United States. And I asked him, I said, what, what are these young doctors to do? I mean, the patients are talking them into doing this compromised treatment. What should they do instead? And he said they should do no treatment. No treatment. He said that most of the dentists who stand in front of peer review did treatment that patients talked them into. It was compromised care to begin with. If you compromise on one thing, you learn to compromise on another thing. One of my clients had a patient come in, and a little old lady, and she had told the doctor, I don't want x-rays, I don't want x-rays. And uh, the doctor had just been chewed out by a referring doctor. This was a specialist that uh, this happened to. And they had just been chewed out by the referring doctor who said, if x-rays are going to be taken, I'm going to take them. I don't want you taking my revenue. And, you know, if, if x-rays are going to be taken, I'm taking them. And so she, this doctor was a little gun shy, especially when the patient came in and said, I don't want x-rays. So she had the patient sign one of those almighty easy forms, you know, denying uh, necessary care to neglect is what, you know, that little form is when they sign and say the patient refuses x-rays, that's agreeing to neglect. Um, she had the patient sign that. And a few months went by and, and uh, she didn't see the patient again. And all of a sudden the daughter of the patient came in and said, I thought you might be interested in, in knowing what happened to my mom. Uh, if you had taken the images that day, you would have seen that little starburst design that was uh, the, the cancer that uh, killed her. And uh, I know she denied, you know, she didn't want those x-rays, I know that. And at that moment, this doctor said, no more, no more, I'm not compromising again. And so some referring doctors don't want to work with this doctor. But uh, this doctor is safer as a result of not compromising. If you compromise on one thing, you'll compromise on another. Yeah, and and uh, you just can't treat everyone. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I think that's amazing. Um, look, look at the number one cause of root canal failure. What is it? What is, so if you do a hundred million uh, root canals on a molar in five in sixty months, ten percent of them are extracted. By general dentists and five percent are extracted by endodontists. But what is the number one cause of the, uh, the the molar being extracted? Because the doctor said you need a root canal and a crown, and she said, "Well, I can't afford the crown. Just do the root canal." Incomplete so, root canal. So, so you 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 did the root canal. You obturated it, and you didn't put a final restoration. Not finished. The saliva has one billion microorganisms, fungi, parasites, and viruses per cc, which is the volume of a nickel. And I mean, imagine that you needed a quadruple bypass, and you said, well, I can only pay for two coronary arteries. So just go in and do a <laughs> double bypass, and yeah. then I'll die of a heart yeah. attack next yeah. year while right. waiting for a quadruple. So, so I always tell them, well, if you can't, you know, it's a root canal on a crown. It's, you can't, it's, we, you know, it's like you're going to get your phone and your cable, and your internet, it's all bundled together. And if you want to unbundle it, then let's just pull the tooth now while I wait five years. Right. And spend that money on three other fillings that will need a root canal in two years anyway. Right. So, um, so, so, the, the, so, um, when you go into an office, I mean, I mean, you you spend more time taking million dollar prices at 2 million, not taking the, um, 500 to 750. Is that a fair assessment? That's correct. I mean, the Seattle study club, those are, you know, they have members though, that, uh, are the doctors who join the Seattle study club are not all at that level, but they want to provide better quality care. Well, if they're they not that level, do, they're, they're in the Spokane, they're, 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 the Spokane Study Club. Oh. The Seattle is the big dogs. Well, it's, no, I mean, they're, 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 they are the moving Spokane. in that direction. <laughs> oh, I know you're kidding. Rawr, rawr, rawr. But anyway, oh, so, but, but go on. But I mean, the, if you don't have a good example, I mean, if you don't have someone you can uh, be with to learn from, and know that this is state of the art, then they're gonna do whatever the art is. 
not necessarily move forward into doing you know the types of care that are, that is available to patients now they don't think it's possible i tell and i'll just tell you i tell dentists sometimes be careful about going to your local dental society meeting i mean support them you know help them encourage them but if you go and everyone there is whining about how bad it is and how horrible it is you're going to start believing them after a while if on the other hand you go to a meeting where people are saying you know this is amazing yeah we've had a little bump in the road or you know we've got it it's kind of slow right now or but it's amazing that we're still able to do the quality of care that we want to do without all the compromise that we used to do when we were only working for insurance well it, it, it's 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 all self-learning place like like you you take clear choice is, is that the, the the implant deal Maybe. And is it clear choice or clear connect? It's not clear so, to me, but it's so, so clear choice <laughs> does about eighteen thousand all on four arches a year at twenty five thousand arch. The median price of a new car is thirty four thousand. What percent of Americans in their lifetime will buy one new car around the median price of thirty four thousand? They will do it. And, and then every dental office in that zip code did not do probably ninety five percent never did one. Twenty thousand dollar full mouth rehab. I mean, I mean, eighty percent of the dental offices haven't done one full mouth rehab in the last decade. Right. So you're like, okay, so eighty percent of the dentists have never done one full mouth rehab, and then there's these, then there's these guys in every little market. Like I can name the guy in Havasu. I can name the guy. I mean, I can name the guy in all these little podunk places who do. About the average price of a new car, about a thirty thousand dollar rehab case. I mean, they they got a couple of them going all the time. Sure. So why does one guy never did one in a lifetime when half of his patients in their lifetime will buy a new F one fifty? But you know how much F one fifty, the number one selling truck, F one fifty. Have you seen the price uh, tag of those things? Sixty five now. The, the, yeah, and with all the bells and whistles, yeah. they're ninety eight. Oh, ninety eight. Wow, and, and, nice. and all those patients buying them, they'll say, well, what does the insurance take? And then the staff <laughs> believes it and it's like, well, the insurance won't pay yeah. for well, the implant or I mean, the F-150. But That's what I had to learn because I walked into uh, implant dentistry years ago and I had just come from an office where the doctor sucked nitrous to go to sleep at night because he couldn't pay his bills. He didn't believe patients would accept treatment. He didn't want his staff to ask for payment because he didn't want to offend the patients. He uh, really, you know, just didn't think anything was possible, and it was depressing. It was depressing. So then I walk into an office where implant dentistry was the newest, you know, newest thing. We're going to check this out. We're going to find out if, if, if it can be done. One of the first conversations I had was with a plastic surgeon who, when the plastic surgeon found out we were doing cosmetic surgeon, of course, they probably call that in Phoenix, uh, the cosmetic surgeon knew we were doing implant dentistry, reconstruction, full mouth reconstruction, came to our office and said, I need help. He said, I'm doing cosmetic surgery and the patients still think they're ugly. When they look in the mirror, they still see ugly. And I said, well, you should do better work. And the uh, cosmetic surgeon said, we do beautiful work. We look at our before pictures, we look at our after pictures. What we did is perfect. The only problem is the patient still sees ugly. So we started looking for the ugly, and the ugly is the teeth, or lack thereof, you know. And we can only stretch tissue so much, we can only cover up so much, but if their teeth are still ugly, and they see ugly, they're ugly. And so they said, we need help. In talking to them, they started asking, what kind of fees do you have for this type of dentistry? And I told them. They said, well, how do you get paid for this kind of dentistry? And I said, that's hard. You know, you must make financial arrangements according to the patient's ability to pay or you'll lose your patience. Have you heard that one? I lost my patience with that because if you make financial arrangements according to what the patients say they can afford or what they say they can pay, it's a non-payment plan and non-treatment plan. I mean, it's patients say one thing, but in reality, if they see the value that outweighs the price, they'll find a way to, you know, buy that instead of the F-150. And so these cosmetic surgeons said, you know, how do you get paid? And I said, it's hard. You know, we tried payment plans. We work with their insurance. We, they said, why do you do that? And I said, because we don't want to lose patients. They said, which patients would you lose? I said, well, I guess the ones who weren't going to pay. 
Then they said, what would that make room for? I said, well, patients who pay, because patients who pay refer patients who pay, you know, and so on. That being said, what they taught me was you need to change your thinking if you want the patients to change their thinking. If I didn't think they had the money, if I didn't think they would accept treatment, if I'm in a small town and I don't think patients are gonna, you know, put down $35,000 for life-changing care, they won't if I don't think they will. But some of the practices I've consulted with in implant dentistry have been in small towns and they're the largest practices oh, around. I know. I, know. I mean, there, there's, there's people in places like Lafayette, Louisiana, where they still haven't sure. invented shoes yet. Right. And there's, there's friends of ours that are placing 90 implants a month. Sure, sure. In Lafayette. Yeah. And then the dentist in LA says there's no money out there. Oh, no, they're, they're, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, when people tell me, well, we can't do that here, I say, you're right, you can't. As long as you think you can't, you can't. And this is not you know positive thinking mumbo jumbo, it's I learned firsthand Patients would come in, the cosmetic surgeon said to me, why don't you just tell them what you can do? You guys tell them what you can do and let them tell you when they can do it. You know, tell them what the, tell them what the fee is and they'll tell you when they can pay it. They may not have the money today. And this is when I ran into this lost patient situation. When a patient says no today, that might not mean no tomorrow. But I would rather they say no today than to get something cheaper today and regret it tomorrow. I'd rather they wait until tomorrow to do the right thing instead of just doing the compromise but, care. But, but how, do, how do you coach these guys? Because, you know, the, the, the natural selection was you're only going to get into this club you get A's in chemistry and physics. I mean, I mean, I was the biggest geek at creating news. I didn't have a car or a date for three years right. and got accepted a year early. And I was proud of getting accepted a year early. I, I, I was almost 40 where I realized, yeah, you got accepted a year early because you're a stupid geek idiot who lived in a library for three years. And, <laughs> and so your classmates, they'll, they're honest with you. They, they, I, don't, I don't like cells. I, I don't like that. I didn't That's go to okay. school. I didn't sit in a library and get an A in calculus to sell. So, so, so the dentist just admit that I hate selling and get a treatment coordinator that likes to sell? Because I've noticed some of these offices that are struggling, no one in the office likes to ask for money. Well, that's, that's some, a hiring some, issue. Some, some, some people love it. Some yeah, people some, absolutely yeah. love sales. Can here's my rule for, here's how I hire someone. Here's how I hire someone who who can talk money, for example, with a patient. Number one, will they show up? <laughs> Number two, will they act like they're happy to be there? Because if they're running every time it's time to talk about money, it's going to be tough for them to be successful. So will they show up? Will they act like they're happy to be there when it's time to talk about money? You know, will they get in there? And number three is, do they believe in the value of the dentistry? And see, if the dentist doesn't believe in the value of their dentistry, the, none of the staff are going to believe in the value of the dentist, dentistry. Because if the dentist is backing off constantly, the staff are backing off constantly. I tell dentists, your actions, what you say, what you do, how you treatment plan is a lesson that they're learning. They're learning to think small. They're learning to think insurance. They're learning to um, make that all the total conversation. And it, with insurance, whoever brings it up first pays. If you bring up insurance, that was, the whole conversation. Did you, did you see the HBO movie, the Bernie Madoff movie? No, I didn't. I mean, he was the largest pyramid scheme ever, $50 billion. Uh-oh. And he's talking... Fun. He's talking all through the movie that when you when you go to a uh, when you go to dinner when you're networking with these serious investors, that if he mentioned the money, do you need to take it? No, I uh, need to turn uh, it off. No worries. You know my brothers call me every day and I love it. Your brother. So I will. That was my brother. I have three. I would, but my uh, brother in the prison they can only use the payphone on Saturdays. <laughs> and uh, but uh, but oh, no, okay, they, but Bernie Bernie Madoff. It was a great movie because uh, Bernie Madoff when he would go lunch he would not bring up the fact that he has an investment fund and he wanted you to invest millions. He said, if I bring it up first, then I'm selling and they won't give me their money. And he had the biggest whale in the world and he sat there and dinner was almost over and then he's starting to leave before the guy said, well, how's your investment fund doing, Bernie? And then, so, so yeah, so if you bring up insurance first, it's you, gonna be all about that. If you don't bring in insurance first. Yeah, I don't, I don't bring it up. I let the patients bring but, it but, up. But, yeah, but specifically, have, have, in your, you've been doing this how many years? 30 years. 30 years. In 30 years, do you have success 
taking dentists who hate selling and making them sell? Or do you think the better solution is, let's let's go to HR and let's find someone who loves it? Because some people absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. So do you like to convert a dentist, I hate to sell, to sell? Or do you like to bring in someone else and be a treatment plan presenter? Uh, I guess I don't, what I do is not necessarily teaching sales, sales, sales. Instead teaching uh, value, value, value. It's less, what, what is it that you want to do? What is the value of that? Do they understand the value of that? Do they know why it you know, is, wor is worth it for a patient to do this? And then let's bring everyone along. Uh, sometimes when I go in to work with dentists, they don't necessarily um, see the value of their dentistry. So that's one of the first things I wanna look at. I wanna look at their treatment planning process even though I'm not a dentist, I want to see what is their thought process. Usually they just focus on one tooth or their staff member has already told them their insurance will pay for this and that's it. And so they focus on what kind of dentistry I can sell, if they even use that word, just within that insurance limitation. Um, I rarely find a dentist who cannot communicate. If they can't communicate, then I do want to hide them or not let them ruin it. Because sometimes they'll, they'll talk too soon, talk too fast. Simple things like, for example, I timed the, timed the consultation on doctors. How long does it take for a patient to accept treatment? How long? You know, is it five minutes, is it 10 minutes, is it 15 minutes or 45? I don't, I don't <coughs> tell doctors, talk five minutes and shut up. I just want to know, when are you effective? When does a patient say yes in the conversation? When does the light bulb go on and they say, oh, I see, this is what I want? You know, when does that happen? And many times their staff members know, and their staff members know when the doctor should shut up, know what the doctor says that they shouldn't. I was in Nacogdoches, Texas, implant practice, and the doctor wanted to do more implant dentistry but he said, I mean, his staff told me, you know, he'll talk and talk and talk to a patient going from treatment plan to treatment plan to treatment plan to treatment plan until they accept a swing lock partial. I'll never forget that visit. I didn't even know what a swing lock partial was. I said, what do you mean? What's a swing lock partial? They showed me little posterior segments that clicked in, locked in at any rate. I said, what do you mean he talks and talks until they accept a, tree, a, a swing lock partial? And they said, it's the last thing he's got to offer them. <laughs> he just presents this. If that doesn't hit, he presents the next thing. If that doesn't hit, he presents the next thing until the treatment value goes down and down and down and down and down until he has nothing of less value than the swing lock partial. <laughs> I said, so what should he do? They said, if he would just shut up, Patients would accept treatment. I said, well, how can we get him to shut up? One doctor I timed, if he talked more than 15 minutes, we, we audited simply the function of time. If he talked more than 15 minutes, patients would not accept treatment. If he talked 15 minutes or less, patients would accept treatment. So your, your, your website is shoutforjoy.com. Love it. Um, Yes. So what, what, do you, what do you do? What do you do for dental? Is this dentistry and sensor? What do you do? What do you charge? What What's I normally do. What I normally do is I, I speak. I love to speak for their study club. I love to speak for their small group. There, I love a group of people who want to be there because not just for the credit, but I love people who want to be there because they want to learn. I speak for them. I do specialized uh, consulting in the area of the business of implant dentistry is is my number one special area. Moving a patient from not even knowing anything about it, even though it's in the media and it's clear choice and all over the TV commercials, but do they understand what it is, how to talk about it, how to get paid for it, that's a big thing, how to get paid for it because the fees are uh, often much more than what the fees would be for conventional dentistry. And so uh, how to get paid for it, managing risk, how to prevent loss, risk management loss as well as patient loss, the whole system of how to incorporate implant dentistry into the practice. That's my field. My um, business has been 
complete referral or repeat. And how, how do they People contact you? Just go to shoutforjoy.com. 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 S H O U T spelled out. S H O U T F O R J O Y dot com. Well, hey, uh, can I? Um, I just want to say that uh, um, congratulations on all that you done. I mean, you spoke for the Seattle the Study Club two hundred times. Oh, more than that. Two hundred times. I mean, that that alone is. This is. Uh, makes uh, you a whole they're favorite. having their twenty fifth anniversary this coming January. I've been to twenty four of the symposiums and and. Done a lot of things there. It's as amazing well as that Seattle, uh, Seattle Study Club, Amazon, Microsoft, Boeing, uh, Starbucks. It's a it's a hotbed of uh, free thinking people out there. It really is. And you. And me. Uh, what a treat to meet you. Hey, honor to meet you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming <laughs> to my house.